Hi, it's me, Teresa, and this is the last lecture of the class. Uh, it's on human evolution, and then a little bit about uh, hormones at the end. Okay. So, um, we're talking about fossils, first off, and we've been talking about fossils quite a bit uh, in this class, so I don't have to go too terribly far into the different things that we've covered. But um, essentially, you know, fossils come in a number of different forms. We have uh, parts of organisms, particularly the parts that are the most durable, like bones, skulls, teeth, uh, that have fossilized. And the way that they fossilize is by that organism or part of it um, being deposited in the bottom of a wet area and then covered over with sediment over time, and then the sediment starts to solidify and becomes turned into rock, and the item that was originally there is replaced by minerals, by rock. And so a fossil is not the actual thing. It's not you know, a dinosaur bone or um, a dinosaur feather or whatever you want to talk about. It's not the actual thing. What it is is a rock that has replaced that actual thing. And we don't have a lot of these kinds of fossils because they're very difficult to create. So you have to have those very specialized environments where there is water and that it is calm enough down at the bottom uh, in order for the the object to be turned into a fossil in order for it to be permineralized and turn into a fossil over time. And it's not just bones that fossilize, though that's the most common thing, bones and teeth, because they are the hardest parts of the body. They're the most likely to be preserved, uh, but you can fossilize anything. You can fossilize, like I say, a feather or scales or an egg or an imprint. So for example, like a footprint. And from a footprint, we can see uh, a lot of different things about the animal. You know, what do its feet look like? Do they look like a dinosaur? Does it look like a human? Um, and those kinds of things. And it's the exact same process, whether you're talking about an imprint or the bone itself. You have the, the imprint, for example, uh, this footprint. Uh, people were walking across uh, a lake or um, the edge of a creek or some watery area and they created their footprints as they were stepping through like people do when you're walking through the sand or the mud and then slowly it was filled in over time until the actual imprint became fossilized. Now there are some other items that we might have from you know 10,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago that are the actual object itself. So you might have, for example, um, a, a mammoth frozen in the tundra, or you might have uh, an insect preserved in amber, or you might have an actual bone that's you know, less than 10,000 years old, or a piece of wood that's less than 10,000 years old. And in those cases, you, it's the actual item. It's a frozen mammoth or um, you know, a preserved insect. Uh, and that's not a fossil. So that's essentially a frozen mammoth, like you put it in a deep freeze forever. It's still the mammoth itself. It hasn't fossilized. Um, and then there are things that human beings make, and we call those artifacts. So things like tools, or pottery, or um, the remnants of a fire. Those kinds of things are artifacts. They're things that were created by humans. So, Especially when we're talking about human fossils, there weren't a lot of early humans around to begin with. And so when we do have a fossil of one, we want to study it carefully and learn as much as we possibly can from it. So what are the kinds of things that we can tell from fossils? Well, for example, if we were to look at fossilized teeth, you could tell things about what the animal ate. You can tell this both by the shape of the teeth and how they are like other animals and what those other animals might eat and then compare them morphologically. But also you can look at the isotopes in the teeth and the wear on the teeth and that will also tell you things about what the organism ate. 
If you look at certain parts of the body, you can also tell things like whether or not the animal was bipedal. Okay, so bipedal means two feet. These are organisms that walk on two feet, like humans do, like we do. Okay, so if you were to look at the pelvis of a modern human, you would see that the spine articulates going straight up from the pelvis. And that indicates that this organism walked on two feet, was bipedal. Whereas if you look at a chimpanzee pelvis, the spine articulates going out from the pelvis. And so that tells you that the animal walked on four legs, or four, walked on all fours, um, a quadruped. And if you were to look at the feet, the feet tell the same story. If you look at the feet of a chimpanzee, you can see that they have a divergent big toe, and that's for climbing in trees. Whereas if you look at a modern human, a homo sapiens, we have a rigid footbed, and that is for walking on two feet. If you were to look at an Australopithecus, one of our uh, ancestors, you, you could compare then their fossilized bones to modern day chimpanzees, modern day homo sapiens, modern, us, you know, modern day humans, and say which one are they most like. And except for the size, they're very much like us. They clearly walked on two feet because their spine articulates out of the top of the pelvis, and the foot tells the same story. So those are the kinds of things that we can tell by looking at the fossils of human ancestors. Of course, we can also date the fossil itself. So you date the layer, any igneous layer below, and any igneous layer above where you find the fossil. Okay, so the fossil is in a sedimentary layer. We talked about how they were made in a previous lecture. And you can date any igneous layer below and any igneous layer above with uh, radiometric dating, and there are many different types that you can use, and then that will tell you how long ago that organism lived. Uh, if you're looking at things like the pelvis, um, or if you have multiple skeletons for comparison, you can also tell things like the sex of the individual. Was this a male or a female? Um, or how old was this individual when they died? Have they, you know, if we can compare them to other skeletons, um, in their species, are they a teenager, are they a child, those kinds of things. So a lot of really good stuff. How long ago they lived, what kind of diet they ate, whether they walked on all fours, um, whether they were bipedal, uh, how old they were, um, all of these various aspects we can tell by looking at the fossil and comparing it to modern day animals and comparing the morphological similarities and differences and make um, make a determination about those, those factors for that, for that individual. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about hominids, which are our closest relatives. Okay. So if you were to go by the psychology department office at SBSB on the third floor, uh, you will see a lot of replica skulls. And this is to emphasize to the students that our evolutionary history is important to psychology, that it matters. The environment in which we evolved matters to how we are today. Okay, so like I say, hominids are animals that are more like us than they are like apes. These are all members of our family tree that we're talking about. Some of them are direct ancestors and some of them are offshoots of our lineage, and I'll, I'll talk about that as we go on. Okay, so around six to 10 million years ago, so, you know, right in around eight million years ago, there was an organism that was the ancestor of us and chimpanzees and gorillas. And at that time, we broke off from our, from our ancestor one line went on to become gorillas and another line went on to become us, okay? So if you look at both the fossil layers and you compare uh, DNA, 
you can see uh, through several different uh, methods how long ago we had a common ancestor. And so our common ancestor with gorillas, like I say, was some kind of organism that was both the ancestor of us and gorillas. And then around six million years ago, we broke off from the chimpanzee branch of our family. And one line went on to become our genus, the homo genus, and another line went on to become chimpanzees. Okay. So here is one possible common ancestor of both humans and chimpanzees. Uh, his name is Sabalanthropus chidensis. And Sahelanthropus chidensis is in the right age range for being one of our ancestors. So this fossil is six to seven million years old, and it was found in Africa in the general right area where we um, would expect to find our ancestors. However, the only part of this uh, organism that we have left that fossilized was the skull. And in fact, we don't even have the bottom part of the skull. So we can't tell whether or not this organism was bipedal or not. Um, there's also something interesting about the skull itself. It has this thick brow ridge. And if it is one of our ancestors, that would kind of complicate our family tree. Because while chimpanzees maintain this thick brow ridge, we obviously don't. And our next ancestors that we know of that are definitely our ancestors, the Australopithecines, Australopithecus, that genus did not have a thick brow ridge. And you don't see it again in our lineage until Homo erectus. So it would have meant that we evolved the thick brow ridge, then it went away, then it came back. And that, that's a little bit too complicated for paleoanthropologists. They like the explanations to be pretty simple. So, the, what, what we say about Solanthropus chidensis is that we don't know where he goes, okay? We don't even know if he's bipedal because we can't see where the spine would articulate with the skull. If the opening for the spine is on the bottom of the skull, it indicates you walk on two legs, whereas, it, whereas if the opening is at the back of the skull, it indicates you walk on all fours. So, we don't really know. So Alanthropus chidensis is a possibility of one of our ancestors, but we're not positive where this uh, organism goes in our family tree. This guy, though, we do. Okay, this guy we have a pretty we have pretty solid indication that Artipithecus is uh, one of the members of our lineage. Okay, so Artipithecus lived four to six million years uh, ago. And we first found a fossil of Artipithecus in 1994. But then in 2009, we found a really nice partial skeleton. And you, you can see him right here. And they named him Artie, because we are not creative at all. <laughs> Artipithecus is named Artie. And he's a very interesting uh, organism because his foot bones are intermediate between what you might see on a chimpanzee and what you would see on a human. So he does have a divergent big toe, but he also has a rather rigid footbed. So it's kind of intermediate. And if you were to look at Artie's pelvis, it would tell you the same story. And this indicates that this organism is kind of halfway in between, an intermediate uh, fossil. Um, he probably spent some of his time in the trees and some of his time walking on the ground on two feet. And the, the usual way that paleoanthropologists think that humans became bipedal, it's called the open savanna hypothesis or the open savanna theory. And it's that we had been living in the jungle and so we had been, you know, brigading and jumping through the trees, but then the jungle started to disappear and the open savanna, uh, the grasslands opened up. And so we evolved to be bipedal because it was advantageous, you know, maybe seeing over distances or for whatever reason it was advantageous for us to be uh, bipedal on the open grasslands. But Artie kind of challenges that because Artie was doing both. Artie, first of all, we know he was living in a forested area because the other organisms you find in the same layer are forest animals, okay? So he's living alongside forest animals, 
and he seems to be walking upright some of the time and climbing trees some of the time. And so perhaps our um, evolution from being a, a tree dwelling, an arboreal animal, to being a bipedal animal walking on the ground uh, happened a little bit differently than we may have thought. But what there's no doubt about is that this guy is the earliest true hominid we have. Okay, so if you want to look for the fossil of the earliest true hominid, the earliest organism that we say this is not so much like an ape and definitely more like a person, we're going to turn to Artipithecus ramidus around four to six million years ago. Okay, now this is Lucy, and Lucy was a complete game changer. Lucy is an Australopithecus afarensis, and I'll write that. Okay, so Lucy was the real game changer. Lucy was discovered in 1974, okay? So Artie was discovered in 1994, 20 years after Lucy was discovered. And it, a couple by the name of Johansson were um, paleoanthropologists, and they were at a dig in uh, Africa, and they found Lucy. And up until this point, there had been a fair amount of criticism about including human beings in the evolutionary tree of all other organisms. There were people, of course, who were saying, you know, humans are special and distinct and out here, and they don't fit in with everything else. And one of the main criticisms was that we couldn't find any intermediate fossils, anything in between an organism that looked like an ape and an organism that looked like a modern human. And so that was a big criticism. There are no intermediate fossils. And when we found Lucy, that really blew everything out of the water, okay? So a couple by the name of Johansson, 1974, they discovered Lucy. And the first thing we have to ask is, when we find a new fossil, is where does this go in the phylogenetic tree? Is it like, you know, is it closer to apes? Is it closer to humans? Where does this organism go? And so we look at all the species we know, and we put, we try to put her skeleton in with other known species. And so we, if we want to ask, is she in our species, we look at all the members of our species, from the shortest to the tallest, from the youngest to the oldest, males and females and everybody in between. We look at all of the different skeletons that we have, and we say, does she fit in this group? And the answer for Lucy was clearly no. She is different than us, though she has many similarities. And in fact, she was so different than us that not only did she get her own species, she got her own genus. And this whole new genus of Australopithecines um, was discovered in discovering uh, Lucy. And since then, we've discovered more uh, Australopithecines, more um, species of Australopithecus, but she was the first one that we found, and like I say, she was uh, revolutionary. And in that same area in Tanzania, we find a set of footprints, of fossilized footprints that are called the Laetoli footsteps, and it's about 80, uh, 80 foot long trail of these footprints. And so obviously there were these organisms that walked alongside the, uh, the lake or um, uh, pond, whatever this was, and as they walked alongside, they left footprints. And if you look at the sets of footprints, there's one larger set of footprints and one smaller set of footprints. And the smaller set of footprints looks like it was carrying a burden on one side because of the way that one side um, digs into the mud a little bit more, all right? So people have hypothesized that perhaps this was a couple, a male and a female, and the female might have been carrying a baby, and they were walking across the edge of a lake. However, we can't say that for sure. 
It could have been a teenager and a parent. It could have been, you know, any set of, um, of Australopithecines. But what's pretty clear is that it was made by um, Australopithecines and probably Australopithecus afarensis, the same kind as Lucy. The timing is right. These are about three and a half million years old. And the place is right. This is where we find fossils of Australopithecus afarensis. This is the right time, the right place, the right size, the right shape. And so everything fits with this being Australopithecus afarensis. Now, whether it was a couple or not, that's up for debate. But what's not up for debate is how human-like these footprints are. They are almost indistinguishable from modern-day humans, except for that they're a little bit smaller. And so we know that this was two bipedal members of uh, Australopithecus species walking along together. It's a, it's a frozen moment in time, and it's really, really cool. If you ever have a chance to go out and look at footprints, I strongly recommend you do it. Um, there are some wonderful dinosaur footprints in the United States, uh, right outside a place called Tuba City. Tuba City, it's near, it's near the Grand Canyon. Uh, on the Navajo Reservation, there are some beautiful dinosaur footprints, and I strongly recommend you go. Don't believe anything else they tell you when you go there. It's just dinosaur footprints. Everything else, they don't know what they're talking about. Okay, But give them a nice tip anyways. The dinosaur footprints are real, and the dinosaur footprints are awesome. Okay. Um, another member of uh, the Australopithecus genus is uh, Australopithecus sediba. And we first found uh, Australopithecus sediba fossils in Africa, in that same general area, in 2010. And the specimens that we found, we found two very beautiful specimens of an adult female and a teenage male. And so we've been able to uh, figure out a lot about these particular Australopithecines. They lived about two million years ago. And um, they are actually probably descended from another Australopithecus called Australopithecus africanus. Okay, Australopithecus africanus. And so we think A. sediba is a, a descendant of theirs, definitely a fully bipedal animal, definitely a relative um, of ours. Where exactly on the family tree? We'll talk about in just a sec. Okay, this guy though, I want to mention Paranthropus boise. So Paranthropus boise um, was another uh, hominid. However, he's so different from us and so different from uh, uh, Australopithecines that he also gets his own genus. So Paranthropus is his genus and there's a number of members of that genus. Um, this guy, though, they called Nutcracker Man. And they called him Nutcracker Man because he has these big, um, flat teeth. And they imagined, you know, you could take them and crack nuts together. But that's not what he actually did at all. That's just, a, you know, a, a nickname that they gave him. So if you look at his teeth and compare them to our teeth, ours are tiny and delicate, whereas his are big and broad. Um, and what does this tell us? It tells us he ate grass. And if you look at the isotopes in his teeth, it tells you the same story. So um, these are more like horse teeth. So not for cracking nuts, but for eating grass. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about our genus. Okay, so I've been talking about hominids, the first known true hominid, starting with Artie. And then I've been talking about the Australopithecines, who are also hominids. But now I'm talking about specifically our genus, OK? So these are the other members of the Homo genus. These are our closest relatives. And one of the guys who we know is in our lineage is Homo habilis. Homo habilis means handyman. And he was the first hominid that we know made his own tools. Now, previous to Homo habilis, it's possible that we were using found items as tools, 
So for example, you, you know, a, 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 an ancestor of ours, Artipithecus or an Australopithecus, one of these guys may have picked up a stick and used it to dig something out. But we wouldn't know about that in the fossil record. If that thing fossilized, which would be very unusual for something like a stick to fossilize, but even if it did, we wouldn't know that it was used as a tool necessarily. It would just look like a stick. Okay, so the first indication that we have of a guy making tools is Homo habilis. And he made all kinds of groovy tools, okay? So hand axes and um, somewhat thinner blades that were probably like for stripping, um, maybe stripping meat from a hide or something like that. And so we gave him that name, Homo habilis, handy man, because he was the guy who uh, you know, started the Stone Age, started us on our journey of using these hands to make tools. So Australopithecines did not make tools. They were bipedal and they had hands, obviously quite a lot like ours, but they weren't using them to make tools yet. That didn't come about uh, in the fossil record until we find Homo habilis. Okay. Uh, I do want to point out this family tree. So this is one possibility of how our ancestors fit together. Here on the other side is another possibility. But there's no argument that these are, these are members of our family tree. There's no debate among scientists that you know evolution is true and that these things happened at these times, that these fossils are these ages. We don't doubt those things because we have very hard science, radiometric dating and all of that good stuff. However, exactly where everybody fits in, that's the kind of thing that scientists like to argue about, okay? So here's one possible family tree, and this one is pretty um, widely accepted. We have Lucy back here, Oslopithecus afarensis. Um, and then we have the Paranthropus line that branches off from the Oslopithecines. So there's Paranthropus Boise all the way up there. There's Nutcracker Man. These are all members of his genus, okay? So ones that are older than him, and there he is. You can see that they're distinctly an offshoot that goes to one side, and then they die out. There are no more Paranthropus on Earth. However, the Australopithecines that took the other branch, you see Australopithecus africanus, that was uh, Australopithecus sediba's ancestor, and then you see that line go on to become our genus. Here's Homo habilis, handyman. And then I'm going to talk about some other important members of our lineage, like Homo hybridensis, Homo erectus, and of course, eventually us, Homo sapiens. Okay, Homo erectus, there is some debate about whether Homo erectus is one of our direct ancestors or an offshoot. Okay, so there are people who um, have opinions in both directions, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So if you were to look at an Australopithecus, here's an example skeleton of an Australopithecus, and then here's Homo sapiens, us, and right in between you can see Homo erectus is about halfway in between in terms of height and um, morphology of his body. Homo erectus was living from two million years ago all the way up to a half million years ago. Okay, so that is one and a half million years on Earth. And Homo erectus did something very important in that time. Okay, so half a million years ago, you don't see him anymore. 500,000 years ago, he goes out of the fossil record. But from two million years ago to a half million years ago, we find Homo erectus in the fossil record. And he was the first hominid to leave Africa. Okay, so our African, our ancestors were all in Africa up to Homo erectus. All the Australopithecines, the Paranthropus species, all of those guys were talking about Africa, okay? However, Homo erectus, if you look at this map, everywhere in blue is areas where Homo erectus spread. So Homo erectus spread all the way through Africa and all the way across Asia, straight on over to the Far East Coast. Okay, so also, or, uh, Homo erectus was an extremely successful species, and he used tools first to leave Africa, traveled all over Asia, used fire and all that kind of good stuff, a pretty um, 
a pretty capable organism, okay? Uh, very human-like. And there's some interesting things, like I say, about the Homo erectus uh, skeleton. So they have this thick brow ridge. And that's one of the main things that makes people say, mm, you know, are they really in our lineage or are they just kind of an offshoot of our lineage? But here's an interesting fact. Most people, most human, most Homo sapiens living today have flat incisors. Our front teeth are flat if you feel the back of them. If you take your tongue and run it across the back of your teeth, it's flat. But there are some people who the back of their teeth is kind of shaped with a ridge around the edge, like a shovel. They call them shovel-shaped incisors. And most people who have that have Asian heritage, okay? So of course people are spread all over the globe at this point, but it's usually people who have Asian heritage. So for example, I have a cousin who's part Filipina and she has shovel-shaped incisors. And so did Homo erectus. So that makes some people wonder if there are certain humans alive today that retain some part of Homo erectus. But that's a big question mark. That's up for me. Okay, this guy, Homo heidelbergensis, was definitely one of our ancestors. And Homo heidelbergensis was around about a million years ago, all the way to about 100,000 years ago. Um, maybe even as far as uh, 1.3 million years ago, okay, we may have some uh, Homo heidelbergensis that are that, uh, that old. And we find these fossils in parts of Europe like Italy and Spain, England, okay? However, in Africa and Asia, we find a very similar species called Homo antecessor. Okay? And they were living around the same time. And so we ask ourselves, are they're living in two different areas, one, you know, up in around this part of Europe, and the other down around this part of Asia. Are I mean Africa, this part of Africa, are these guys the same species who have just spread out, or have they started to actually speciate? And that's the question that um, scientists ask themselves. And it really comes down to, are you a lumper or are you a splitter? A lumper will want to put them all in the same species. A lumper will want to say, oh, it's all Homo heidelbergensis. All those guys that you find over there in Africa, Asia, those guys are also Homo heidelbergensis. They're just a subgroup, a subspecies or a subpopulation. Whereas if you were the guy who discovered Homo antecessor, you're going to want to say, oh, no, 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 this is a different species, and you're going to want to point out all the small differences. But that's the kind of thing that we don't know. We don't know whether they were truly speciated. Because we can look and see small differences, but you can also see small differences in a Siberian tiger versus a Sumatran tiger. And so now we say, oh, well, those are two subspecies. They haven't fully speciated yet, but they're on their way. Now, this brings us to an interesting next question. Around 400,000 years ago, 350,000 years ago, we see a distinct split in uh, homo, uh, members of the homo genus living in Europe and members of the homo genus living in Africa. And so you clearly see up in Europe this guy, Homo neanderthalensis, neanderthal man, okay? And neanderthal man existed on Earth. We have fossils that are 300,000 years old, and we have fossils that are 20 to 25,000 years old. So he existed for a really long time up there in Europe and a little bit into Asia, okay? So he was there for quite a bit. Whereas our branch, Homo sapiens, we see in Africa around 200,000 years ago, and of course all the way up until today, and now we're all over the world. So what happened to cause that speciation? Was it that Homo heidelbergensis then speciated into Homo neanderthalensis? and that uh, Homo antecessor speciated into Homo sapiens in Africa, and now we were two distinct species, uh, we don't know. 
And what drove that speciation? Was it because we were isolated populations and there were one kind of human up here in Europe and another kind of human down here in Africa? So was it population isolation? Or was it a slow accumulation of changes over time? Those are the two possible ways, you know, that we get speciation, but it's not entirely clear if it was kind of a slow march or if it was because these guys were, you know, distinctly separate from one another. However, what we do know is that when Homo sapiens found their way, when guys like us found our way to Europe, you don't see Neanderthals anymore. Okay, so 20, 25,000 years ago, there are no Neanderthals in the fossil record. When we first found Neanderthal skeletons, it was really interesting um, because the first Neanderthal skeletons is where our idea of like cavemen comes from. So when they found these skeletons, they found that they were hunched over, that they were bow-legged, that they had these thick brows, and at the same time, they were discovering things like cave paintings. And so there came, became this kind of popular image of the caveman, you know, living in a cave and going, ooh, 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 ooh. you know, this kind of um, hunched over, not well-developed, um, human-like, ape-like ancestor. Well, it turns out that that's not the case at all. After we found more Neanderthal skeletons, we came to find that they were very much like us. Um, maybe a little bit bigger, a little bit thicker of skeletons, but extremely similar to ours. If you were to see a Neanderthal sitting in class dressed up as a modern day human, you couldn't tell the difference between him and everybody else. Okay, So they're very much like us. And it turns out that the first skeletons we found were a very old, disabled Neanderthals. That these were very old people who were hunched over and had lived through significant disability. And it was actually remarkable that they were able to keep those people alive and that they were clearly such valued members of the society that you would keep this disabled old person alive. So that indicates, you know, among other things, that they were a very highly developed species. They were using, you know, all kinds of weapons and tools and spears and, and these kinds of things, uh, very similar to Homo sapiens. But then you don't see them in the fossil record after 20 to 25,000 years ago. So what happened? Well, we know Homo sapiens spread all over the world. Okay, so we originated, like I said, the earliest known fossils we have of humans are from uh, a city called Hirtu in Ethiopia, okay, so in Africa, obviously, are our oldest known Homo sapien members of our species. And then we spread out. And there are different people who have different timelines for when that happened, you know, oh, it happened 60,000 years ago that we went here, and then 15,000 years ago we went over there, and all of that is up for debate, okay? We're not exactly sure, but what happened when Homo sapiens reached Europe? Did we murder the Neanderthals? Did we kill them? Did we give them some kind of disease that killed them? Or did we breed with them? And were there just so many of us that we kind of overwhelmed their DNA? There are some researchers who believe that some modern humans, specifically people who have ancestors that come from Eastern Asia areas, that some of us may have Neanderthal DNA. That's up for debate. But I do want to talk about some other members of our genus. So this guy is Homo floresiensis, and he lived from around 95,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, all the way up to 13,000 years ago. So that's really modern, okay? These guys were living on the, at the, on the planet at the same time as us, okay? So who was he and how does he fit in with our lineage? We only find this guy on the island of Flores, that's what he's named after, which is in Indonesia. And what it seems like, one of our best guess, is that he's a dwarf Homo erectus. And that what happened is Homo erectus found themselves on this island 
And then they had what's called local evolution. Because if you're in a confined space, you don't have access to, you know, as, mu as many different kinds of food sources. And there are other animals that you find on the island of Flores that also um, are smaller than their ancestors. So for example, there are dwarf um, elephants on that island too, or in the fossil record on that island. And in fact, when we look at Homo floresiensis, we find fossils of animals that he was killing and eating, including elephants, Komodo dragons, giant rats, uh, other animals that were living in that area at that time. We know he's about a meter tall, about three feet tall, um, and so he's a little guy. They gave him the nickname Hob the Hobbit, you know, like um, J.R.R. Tolkien's uh, uh, books. And his brain is a little bit smaller, even for his size, even compared to his size, than ours or than Homo erectus even, who had quite a large brain case for their size. And that's probably because a smaller brain is less costly. Brains take up a lot of metabolism, so having a smaller brain is less costly, and that was probably also beneficial for living on that island in that confined habitat. Um, we know that they had full use of tools and fire and all of those things, and have actually found quite a lot uh, of um, fossils of these guys. Uh, you can see that their skull is very similar to ours. They have the same kind of delicate teeth as we do, very similarly shaped skulls. So definitely one of our relatives, but not a direct ancestor. And then the last thing I want to say about these guys is to get you thinking about how behaviors evolved. Okay, so it, in this picture, the right half that's depicted in green are members of our hominid uh, family tree that could use language. That, you know, these organisms are bipedal for a long time, they've been bipedal, and they evolved to have this very delicate, very intricate voice box that we can use for shaping air in order to make language. And also to understand language, we have these incredibly uh, highly developed brains. And if you look at the gray side, the left-hand side of this image, these are the guys who are, you know, our ancestors who did not have language. So this is where you see the Australopithecines. Australopithecus afarensis, Lucy. There's Artipithecus up there. Um, here's Australopithecus African africanus, uh, uh, Paranthropus boise, these different guys. But then over here you see on the language side, the guys who do have language, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, and other members of our family tree. And that, you know, you see, once language evolved, it took off. And so the animals that didn't have language died out. So that indicates that language was highly beneficial for our species, a highly beneficial adaptation. And those are the kinds of, that's what I want you to be thinking about for the exam. I want you to be thinking about how behaviors and therefore how a brain that allows those behaviors was something that was beneficial for survival and reproduction. I want you to be thinking about proximate mechanisms and ultimate explanations. The proximate mechanisms are all about what's going on right now and so you could be talking about hormones or cultural factors or interpersonal factors, personality, uh, all of these kinds of explanations, developmental factors of what's going on in the here and now. Those are all the proximate explanations. But you also have to be thinking about the ultimate goals. How did those behaviors serve survival and reproduction? Survival and reproduction are the ultimate goals. How did language how did this proximate mechanism serve the ultimate goal of survival and reproduction? And in order to be thinking about that, you need to be thinking about the EEA, the environment of evolutionary adaptation, the environment in which these organisms evolved. And clearly, in the EEA, for our ancestors, language was a positive adaptation, was a positive um, thing that evolved, behavior that evolved. 
Okay, so those are the kinds of things I want you to be thinking about. And now we're going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to talk a little bit more about proximate and ultimate uh, explanations and then also hormones.